morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We'll probably have a few folks uh, join us here. 10 o'clock seems like an early start, but really not. Um, beautiful San Francisco. This is awesome to be here. I'm from Seattle, and this morning I went for a run, and, and it was nice not to see the fog. You know, you see the temperature. It's like going to be high 60s, and they're, yeah, right. You know, if it's foggy, you show up, and it's like 50 degrees. And so it was really nice to see, and the sunrise was beautiful this morning. So I love being here, um, and it's a short flight. Uh, last week I was in, San Francisco, in New York, so this is a really nice, um, easy flight here. So today um, we're going to start off with the state of mobile and modern app development, uh, and then I'm going to go kind of overview of what we're going to talk about the next three days. I'll be here all three days. Um, and it'll be talking about a lot of web development, a lot of mobile development, modern web, we'll talk about that, and using some of the resources and tools available with uh, AWS and mobile and um, categories, you know, how do we talk about like, as a mobile developer or a modern app developer, how do you get started with AWS? That's the big question that we want to answer uh, this week. Because it's a really common um, ask with a lot of the services available through AWS, how do you get started and kind of narrow it down. And so we have a solution with a tool called AWS Amplify. We have some other tools like AppSync. Um, so we want to talk about that this week and uh, get you started. So anytime you have questions, let me know. We'll try to keep it casual. We have a smaller room here. Um, and just to let you know, we are streaming these live on Twitch, a few of these. Um, like later this afternoon, we're going to do a workshop, so it will not be streamed live, so we can go around and kind of help you out and run through a couple of the scenarios. This first talk will just be kind of an overview, 100 level, and then the next one, I want to talk about uh, AWS Amplify, which is the tool chain available that we've been really focusing on for uh, the modern developer to create and cloud enable your resources from your environment. So you create an app locally, and then you deploy uh, the resources locally, push it and pull things in, and be able to um, do it all from the command line. So it's a new development that we've uh, been creating and spending a lot of time in that's also open source and a lot of community driven changes there. So I wanna talk about that a little bit later. So we can agenda. Today is uh, a lot about Amplify, GraphQL, AppSync. Uh, any of you have used GraphQL in the past or are about to? Anybody curious about GraphQL? Okay, good. A few of you, good. Um, and then AppSync, which is based on the hosted GraphQL solution. Um, so we'll be talking about that throughout the day. And the next talk, I'm going to go about talk about the tool chain because I want to make sure everyone is well aware of what the CLI, what the tool chain is, can do, how to install it and get it configured on all the environments so that we each of the sessions that we do, we're not like trying to install everything, get it ready, so we could just start running these commands just like uh, you would with the AWS CLI. Um, anybody not install the AWS Unified CLI before? So everybody has? Okay, there's a few of you. Um, has anybody used uh, the AWS Amplify CLI before? Okay, good. All right, so this will be a first time. So the prerequisites for today is just an AWS account, which um, is something required to get in here. And then um, admin privileges, because when we go and create this sort of like uh, using the AWS CLI, it's a tool set that allows us, our users, to create IM rules, um, accounts and resources within the cloud. So we want to just ask for administrative privileges. Sometimes you get blocked if you only have um, access to certain uh, features or services. Uh, no JS is required for the command line. And then we'll go over the install, but if anybody wants to run through this NPM install while I'm talking, uh, feel free, but we'll go through uh, step by step in the next talk. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you could run a command line and then deploy it. Um, now, it's meant for the, the application web developer and to be able to be in their local environment and then deploy from there. But yeah, you can more than welcome to do it. Just like an AWS CLI has all the commands in there. And I'll talk about how it's category based and the approach is a little bit different than the CLI, the AWS unified CLI. Okay, so we're talking about the state of mobile. I'm going to talk about um, just the, uh, mostly the iOS, Android, talk about the ecosystem and then um, some of the development practices that a lot of the mobile development um, is taking place and talk about modern app development when we talk about um, making modern apps and uh, kind of taking it away from a web or app store application. So again, we got Android and iOS kind of started. They have, they own it. We are not talking about any other mobile devices out there, Windows for one. Um, and then 
Kotlin and Swift are the kind of the main operating system for native Android and iOS. And I'll talk about the other cross-platform hybrid approaches as well. Um, so when we talk about Android, so we talk about some problems when you're uh, a developer with Android and iOS. One of the issues with Android is um, it's the number one operating system. Everybody knows that, so a lot of developers will come in and say, okay, I want the best, I want the most users, the most eyeballs, and I want to develop on Android. Well, when you talk about developing for Android, there's a lot of things that you might want to consider. A lot of it's fragmentation, a lot of it's regional, a lot of it's device dependent. Look at some of these numbers, like in India, there's 96% of all the devices are Android. So when you're talking about an iOS developer, and I want to go into the Android market, or go into the Indian market, I may have a concern because only less than 5% of those users are iOS. 75.9% um, of all smartphones are used globally in uh, November 2017 are Android. So a lot of use cases are those Android devices, but when we talk about breaking those down into fragmentation, this is where we have the, the most popular operating system, but then we start breaking down into fragmentation. So if you want to start releasing features like AR or machine learning on, on devices, or new push notification features. Some of these dates, you have to go back to really older devices. And compared to iOS, there's a lot of um, 80 to 90% of those users are on a uh, previous version, or the latest iOS, or the one before that, so N minus one. But when you look at Android, you look at some of those devices, if you want to approach like 85 percentile or 95 percent of those users, you have to go back to KitKat, October 2013. And then a lot of those are running on older devices. So if you're thinking about a lot of the new features out there that we talk about with machine learning core and, and uh, just some of the cool battery um, preservation pieces, you have to consider this when you have fragmentation. And this is available through the Android Studio. So it's one of the things when you see uh, apps out there like uh, Fortnite and they have you know, iOS only and they haven't developed for Android, there's a reason for that. And possibly because of the fragmentation of all the different devices, the hardware, and the different configurations, it may not be able to run on half of those devices. So you take a game like Fortnite, and you have all these billions of devices, maybe it can only run on half of those devices in the world. Whereas if it was on iOS, it could work on 75% of those devices. So then all of a sudden, we have more population in the iOS than Android. So something to think about when you're developing for different platforms. So I, yeah. No, so he was asking about the KitKat adoption. So if, you, if I was to develop with a 4.4 KitKat, that would uh, address 95.3% of the users out there. So if you want to say, I want to get 95% or more, I'd have to go back to KitKat. But like if I was uh, doing a feature that was only available, like say NuGet, and it's like this is a great battery saving feature, or this is a nice AR feature, I would only address 37% of those users. So this is the thing that we're going to talk about in the next three days is collecting analytics right when you release that app, start understanding your users and figure out exactly who's using what uh, operating system and what type of devices. Yeah, so he's talking about the, carry, the updates for the operating system. And yeah, this is dependent on the carrier. That's another issue with the fragmentation is, so AT&T or Verizon releases their, their, um, their phone, and they have, let's say, Marshmallow. And it's up to them to release their new version of Marshmallow or Nougat. So like I was on a Samsung Galaxy way back at GS3 or the, the 3 version, and I was on T-Mobile, and T-Mobile wasn't updating it. I mean, it was a year or two before you could even get that new version. You can go in online and try to hack it, but the problem with that is you're up to date with whatever AT&T or whatever Verizon's going to provide for that image. Um, so that's the issue. So if you go on the Google phones or like the Nexus, those are uh, updated more frequently. Like I have uh, the Nexus, and I'm already on Oreo because Google is updated, and they're on top of it, and they say, okay, here, you want to update 8.1, 8.2, whatever. Yeah, 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 but the, the carriers just want to keep control of that, and they're not testing constantly and iterating through the different versions, so that's an issue, yeah. So if you're on there, and again, if we have a Samsung Galaxy, uh, same device, one's on AT&T, one Verizon, they're get, and they're both on NuGet, they're gonna, they may act completely different. So that's why we have like a testing real devices in the cloud 
to be able to test out on those environments because it's not necessarily NuGet, it's their own version of NuGet because it is open source. They can kind of put their package together in there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, typically, if you're not doing any of the newer features, the battery, the, the push notifications, the, the notification center, any of those new features that you uh, don't care about, then usually it's KitKat or Lollipop will address the rest of it. But again, if you think about some of these older devices, as, as the uh, operating system gets older, the devices you typically get older as well. So if you have a game that's maybe more modern or a game you know, engine, then you'd want to develop more towards the Marshmallow or Lollipop and then hope that most of those users will be able to use those apps. So then we got iOS adoption. Um, a new report just came out yesterday, so we're on iOS 12, and just 50% uh, of all the users are on iOS 12. So all the iOS devices combined, 50% of those users are now on iOS 12. So go back to the versions when we talk about Android, that's a big deal for mobile developers, is when you're developing apps and you say, I wanna create this feature, then you know that they're gonna be on the latest and greatest iOS. So now I can start talking about building with new features with the Notification Center on iOS 12. 90% of all the iOS devi devices are on iOS N minus one. And then typically those are newer devices. So I don't know what happens to all the older iOS devices, they just <laughs> go somewhere, but um, typically those devices are um, newer, which is two to three years old, um, newer, and then they have the latest operating system. So it comes into play a lot when we talk about like the core ML and machine learning and the newer features. A lot of those things are available to iOS developers and we don't have to think about it. We just have to think about the new size like the iPhone 10X Max and all those. Um, and that's where we have to concentrate. Now the other drawback to iOS is the App Store. Previously it was like 21 days at one point where you had to release an app. It would take, wait 21 days for it to be reviewed in the App Store. Now it's I think 24, 48 hours max. So they really improved that. So it used to be one of those barriers. There's a, still a big barrier to getting in the App Store. If anybody, anybody uh, have an app in the App Store and upload it, it's quite a process. And the Android is not so much. There's a couple things that you can throw in there um, and, and get away with Android, but um, iOS will usually catch those. And then there's certain things that they always want. It's really nice graphics. They want the users um, to you know, have a website to go to, term of uh, content, the, um, release the uh, public release information, all that stuff that you want to be able to collect from those users. Um, they'll force you to put in there for the App Store. So does that make sense for the difference between Android, iOS, kind of a, I want a different approach to talk to you about like why you see some of these newer apps release in iOS first or why they would do Android first, depending on location, depending on the, I, the operating system. Um, it's, it's what a lot of developers will do and think about when they want to um, develop applications. So. Web and mobile converging. Um, we got native apps. So we talk about native is now um, Kotlin is for and um, Java for Android. Kotlin's becoming very popular and the standard for Android development. This is for native. And then for iOS, we have Swift. So Swift development is very popular. It's um, just surpassed uh, Objective C. There's still a lot of Objective C apps out there, but Swift is taken over for the newer apps. Um, support from platform, feature support first, uh, delivery via the App Store, native performance, um, some of the drawbacks maybe have vendor login and no shared code. It's kind of a big deal sometimes when you talk about no shared code. Um, Cross-platform apps, they support the, uh, from community, you have the open source uh, features, features come a little bit later, um, you can del still delivery via the App Store and you have some native performance. Um, Common business logic, one of the ads is 80% common code and common business logic. And these are uh, more of a React Native and Xamarin. Those are the two for cross-platform development that are more like hybrid. So uh, React Native is using the React JavaScript, and then you have Xamarin, which is using the C-sharp.net language to develop, and then it cross-compiles into binary into a, a native application. So when you download the App Store, users don't know the difference between a React Native app a native app that was Swift or uh, Kotlin, and the same thing with Xamarin when you release it in the App Store. There's no way to tell the difference. So now we get into progressive web apps. Yeah. I have a lot of opinions, yeah. I'm very opinionated. Uh, oh, so she was saying, uh, do we have opinions versus like Swift versus React for developing? And that's the battle we're always gonna be talking about. And it all depends on what 
app you're doing, if, if it's more advanced, what kind of developers you have. If you have a full class of JavaScript full stack developers, you may want to go the React, React Native route. If you want re just React and you want progressive web app, so you can kind of cross platform between web and mobile and everything's great and shared code, or you want a really native feel like you're doing machine learning and you're really hitting that processor or the GPU on the device itself, then maybe you want to go more native. So there's a lot of variables. It depends on what uh, your business logic is, what developers you have on hand, and how much you want to invest. Um, so it's, it's just a mix. And we could talk offline if anybody um, wants to learn. But um, just try to avoid the hype-driven methodology. A lot of developers will come in and say, oh, we could develop 110% code share, which doesn't make any sense, 110, but they'll, they'll talk about a code share and everything's great as full stack developer, and then you get into the mix and some things you just can't do depending on what you want to do with that app. But if you want a basic single page, two page app, then yeah, sometimes it's just better just to do a cross-platform progressive web. And progressive web, we're talking about React, um, just a reactive website that's meant for mobile and to take advantage of some of the local caching, storage, and still can use the phone uh, camera, still can use the location, geo, push notifications still available in some cases. So, and a lot of times that's a single code base, 100% common code. So there's advantages across the board. It sounds great, 100% share code, but then when you get into it, you may have issues with some of those native features that you want to take advantage of. Does that make sense? So yeah, I'm opinionated, because I'm, I'm an iOS developer, I'm Swift, and I used to be Xamarin, so I've kind of experienced a little bit of both, because when I'm Xamarin, it's great because it was a language I was familiar with at the time, and then I moved to Swift, and Xamarin was great, but there was also that little hiccup, like a one-day release, like you couldn't get access to the beta, you couldn't access those features, and then if it's not implemented by Xamarin or the .NET community, then I couldn't do it, I have to do it myself, versus if you were native, you'd have all those pieces ready to go. Yeah, so the qu question is, was, does React uh, run slower on the device? And it just depends. I mean, you can optimize it great. You could have, depends on what you want to do and what you're going to render on that uh, device itself. But if it's a single page and you're just rendering text or a blog, then you should have no problem. But if you're trying to render certain graphics and streaming video and audio, then you may have an issue. And so usually we try it out a little bit and you try to see what works best. But it's not necessarily slower or faster either. Yeah. Oh yeah, so the question was, he was asking why I've started with Samsung, and so I have a Samsung and I have an Android device because I'm a developer advocate for mobile, so I like to have all the devices on hand, so. Um, but now I just focus on iOS, and I've always just loved iOS, and that's the only reason. Um, I liked it for some of the reasons with the iOS where I could develop the latest features and be available. Um, I had an iOS my whole life, not my whole life, but since the iPhone was out. So it was just a preference at the time. And you know we have that battle at work all the time. Everybody loves Android, and they can't, you know, don't like the iOS devices. So it just depends. I just love iOS, and I've been focusing on iOS for a while, and um, and on the native side, as you know. And then other teams are really focused on React Native or React Progressive Web App. So it just depends on on whatever you want to talk offline. I can talk about my experiences uh, of being in the App Store um, and developing with React. Um, no, not React Native, but Xamarin or iOS Swift. So in the progressive web apps is the last piece where you could deliver via web, everything's kind of like shared code, you release in the web or um, on, on the phone. Okay, so some mobile trends we're seeing um, in the marketplace for, for development. We're talking like a lot of um, fingerprint, uh, retinal scans, uh, voice activated is another one. So this is where we talk about uh, modern web or modern app development. And modern app development is, is kind of a broad term, but when I talk about modern app development, I'm talking about not just a buzzword, but taking you know the App Store app and the web app and all that, and taking it to a new level and putting like a voice interaction, a bot, like or maybe voting or um, decision making through uh, text only. You know those kind of things are modern apps. We're using the latest framework, the latest. Uh, um, iOS or latest Android 
and you're using the different pieces that are available to, you know, geolocation type um, approaches where the devices walk, you're walking around and you're getting notification based on that exact area. Those kind of things when I'm talking about mobile um, and modern app development. This is we're kind of taking it outside the app store. We have this API on the back end and these IoT devices are connected. Um, maybe you're running a server on the device itself. You, maybe the coffee machine is wired. All this is kind of ubiquitous and, and sending it. But that's when we talk about modern, uh, modern apps. So it's sort of it's an app, and it's, but it's not really in the app store. It's not really web. Or it could be all of the, be up, all the above. So we got biometric identification, uh, voice enabled. Uh, geolocation is a big one. Machine learning and AI. We have uh, a few talks tomorrow. I'm kind of excited about this because I won't be talking about specifically AWS, but like as a mobile developer, what we can do without going into the full building a model and everything, but taking advantage of some of the uh, AI and machine learning that's available to us, like the speech API from Apple or the speech API from Android. Built into those systems that are available with uh, facial recognition, object detection, all that stuff is available to us without even sending anything to the cloud. And then we'll talk about some of the managed cloud services that are available to you. And these are just ways to take kind of your, your app to the next level. And it's not for everything. Like chatbots are great, but as we see in the kind of like a, a, a movement and trend for, for chatbots, because it's only a certain value when you want to make sure, you got to make sure it's great. And maybe you want to set it up for a chat environment, but you don't want to just throw a chatbot in there just because you can. And everybody's realizing that. You got to make sure it's accurate. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, like why it's so um, important, because eventually, as mobile web developers, it's going to be important, I think our, our users are going to expect some kind of machine learning uh, on the device itself, even though they don't know it's machine learning. You know, simple things like text ahead or um, detection of something or maybe categorizing images and putting in tags. Those simple things are going to become so common that you're going to be like, oh, I got to add those. And that's machine learning um, on the edge, on the device itself or creating a model. So in the next year, we're going to be able to create models really fast and do things that we can just, um, that weren't capable uh, a few years back. So augmented reality is another one, and then app integration between different um, apps and devices. So between like mobile and IoT device itself. So these are the trends we're seeing with uh, some of our developers. So the question was like with the term on the edge. So when you talk about on the edge, you're on the device itself. So all the machine learning is done on the edge, which means you're taking a picture and it's going onto the device and then there's a model inside to determine if that person's smiling, what figures, what objects, detection, all that's on the device, on the edge. So it's secure, it's private, there's no bandwidth requirements or anything else. So that's on the edge, on the device itself. Yeah, so like if you have an IoT device or a mobile device, that's done on the edge. Yep, and we'll talk about that tomorrow because you want to use those features as much as you can because they're free to use as part of the framework, part of the operating system. Use it when you can, and then when we talk about building out a speech app, we'll be able to use those frameworks and, and develop, um, and then call the, the hosted cloud services if we want, like celebrity detection. It's hard to do on the device on the edge because we don't have all those, the models of all those celebrities, so we'd have to go and, and do a cloud feature for that. Use what? Oh, so you're talking about green grass and IoT. So um, I haven't really talked about, but yeah, so green grass is on the IoT device. We haven't really talked about green grass on the mobile piece. But yeah, the green grass is another service that you can run on the IoT device that kind of sends out and communicates with. Right, right. But that's about the computing on the edge as well, right? Okay. So now we're to building mobile apps on AWS. So we have a lot of cloud services that we talked about before. So this is a problem for, for some users, for coming in going, okay, this is great because uh, that service is specific for that person or for that team, for that business. And then we always have these developers coming in. It's like a different, you're not DevOps, you're not you know, database administrators, you're mobile, front end. That's really where we're concentrating on. We're really concentrating on the mobile and web application developer and the approach. And so what we've done is try to optimize this. And 
when I talk about the next talk with Amplify is we're trying to categorize these services into very valuable core essential pieces so you can get started. So, so we'll take it, you know, hundreds of services and then bring them down to like the nice narrow part that's so common with, so essentials, we talk about Amazon Pinpoint, which will uh, be a talk later today. And that's talking about uh, collecting analytics and messaging your users. Really important to collect analytics from the beginning. It goes back to that piece where we talked about iOS and Android, knowing who your users are, where they're coming from, what type of devices, what operating system, right off the bat, so that we can go and determine what's going on, if there's any problems, debugging, or if we want to develop new features for those applications, we need to know where they're coming from. Um, Amazon Cognito is our auth piece. So it's, it's actually fairly simple, but instead of using a key, an API key, we're using uh, temporary credentials that Amazon Cognito manages through the user, um, user pools and identity uh, pools. So we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about that later. But that piece is really important for us to make SDK or uh, AWS calls for our resources. So instead of putting API key, we're using resources um, and AWS security credentials for each user instead of sending in a key into the um, app, which a lot of APIs still do, a lot of services still offer that but we want to create a more secure approach and fine grained control for those users, whether they could be unauthenticated or authenticated through Google, Facebook, username and password, whatever it might be. Because remember, every request coming into AWS has to be signed and it has to have some kind of credentials. So before you either have API key or you have this uh, key in secret that you send with the device, which you never should do, and that's where Cognito comes in and kind of capes that for you and encapsulates that in the SDK. So then we have the AWS Device Farm, which we'll talk about tomorrow and the next day, which is real devices in the cloud available for you to test on uh, when you release the app and you get to throw the binary on the real Android devices, real iOS devices, and then there's pools of uh, devices that you can choose, like the top 10 that are uh, in use right now or the top 20, and then you choose those and then release it and it'll tell you how your app is running on those devices. Really important, we talk about games in the App Store so you don't get those bad reviews, like you release an app and it's a game, and again, you know, half the apps may not be able to run it on the Google Play Store. So you want to be sure what devices can run so you let those users know before they uh, download and run it. So they say, okay, it won't run on my device, fine. Um, some of the major services that we apply that are gonna, we're going to categorize, Amazon DynamoDB for NoSQL, S3 for storage, uh, Lambda for serverless. Anybody uh, use Lambda before or daily? I love Lambda. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit of Lambda later. And then API Gateway. So we're gonna talk about API Gateway and Lambda in a little bit in the next talk when we build out a REST API. Um, and then use specific stuff is the Lex, which is the chat bot with Polly, which is the text to speech, speech to text. Um, Polly is again, the text to speech. Uh, Amazon recognition, anybody use that service? Uh, that's our managed um, object face detection and, and tagging for, for images and video. And then um, Amazon CloudFront is our uh, distribution uh, application or distribution service for fronting like an S3 bucket for caching into edge locations. Yeah, so does recognition have anything other than facial recognition? Yes, so if you go to the, the console and you can play around with, it has a lot of tagging of pieces like this is where we're talking about like you could easily incorporate this into they say you have a photo sharing app you can use recognition in the back end right and just to tag and tell you chairs sunset whatever and then you could categorize that and then maybe put a search in front of that so that as soon as they upload an image you can just say show me all pictures of a chair or whatever or show and i don't know if you notice that with ios 12 it now identifies your kids and, and faces as well on the device on the edge right, because it may be sending it on the cloud, but I don't know, but the nice thing is that now all of a sudden, I could say my, my son's name is Iron, I could say Iron, search it'll pull up all my photos of Iron because it knows who he is. So again, that's machine learning, but it's become a standard, so when we create our own photo app, it's gonna be somewhat expected coming down the road, and we're gonna wanna learn how to do that and approach, so. And I'm glad to see some of you are doing it, so I'd like to see how you guys are with the approach. And again, being here is, I wanna learn from you guys too, as, as far as figure out what, what tools you wanna use, what tools you are using, what's not working, what's working. So offline, we'll be gathered around here, so come talk to us and figure out, because this is a learning experience for us as well, to try to understand what, what uh, tools you need to get, uh, get the job done. 
So we support uh, the SDKs, the native SDKs to make these API calls, um, Android, Kotlin, native apps. We have React, React Native, uh, Unity, uh, Angular, Vue, Ember, all the different uh, available. And we'll talk about that when we talk more about the Amplify uh, CLI, the tool chain. So some of the tool sets we've, we've created are um, Amplify, which is our, it's a library for JavaScript developers, uh, has UI components for JavaScript, and then the new tool chain CLI, which is the tooling for native and web front ends. So that's the next talk is we're gonna talk about building out this tool chain and explain what it does, how it works, and all the, and installation. So you don't have to worry about that for now, but um, just know this is the tool for building a cloud enabled app in your environment. So if you take a normal mobile or web app and you run it at local host, then you can easily just deploy categories. So remember we talked about those essential services and those core services. We do category based. If anybody's used Mobile Hub in the past or anything else, we take and say we want to add auth, we want to add analytics, we want to add um, serverless. So those pieces, when we talk about those categories, behind the scenes, it's using Cognito, DynamoDB, uh, AppSync. It might be using some other services tied in with the best practices for security and scalability. So it's really important for for you developers to come in there and say, okay. Now we have all these services, we've narrowed it down, and then we're gonna categorize it so that you can just say auth, deploy, and then it deploys username and passwords, and then it puts in the UI for you for you to log in. Um, and then there's AppSync, which is the hosted GraphQL solution. So this is, uh, it's like remember we talked about API Gateway and Lambda as a REST API. You can now build uh, GraphQL APIs um, through the tool as well. So we have AppSync, and then we have the tool chain that'll allow you to create these AppSync applications and the APIs. Offline, real-time data, mobile webs. This is a lot of the approach too, as we talk about modern app, which is um, offline first, where you could actually make changes and the optimistic UI. So you're making changes, you're sending messages, but it may not be going directly to the cloud. So say you're in the subway or in a train or on the plane, and then when it comes online, it'll sync in sync with the, the cloud. So you've, you've all used mobile apps where you've been offline, offline, in the, even in the elevator. And then all of a sudden you're using it and it just goes offline and the app just doesn't become responsive. So the idea is to be responsive 100% of the time and to be able to cache those responses to the cloud if it needs to and then just kind of sync everything when it comes back online. And all that approach is capable with um, app sync. So less API calls, offline syncing, and then real time data. So if you're subscribing to an event or um, a uh, event in the database that automatically send information back to the device so it's a more of a real-time sort of web socket connection type thing. And then the last piece we offer with AWS Mobile is the finalize the life cycle is the device farm. So device farm has the real devices in the cloud. We talked about like a pool of devices of all the different configurations. We talked about like, let's say you're having an issue and I've developed this app and I'm having an issue with um, a Samsung on AT&T. That's it, but that Samsung on T-Mobile is totally fine. So then you can go to the AWS uh, device farm and then gr grab that device and test it and be able to figure it out because you're not, you don't have all those devices. Or maybe, what if you wanna run um, iOS 10, you know, because 90% of them are always on iOS 11 or 12 and you don't have those devices and d downgrading a device is tough. So you can go to the cloud, choose one of those devices with the operating system that you want and then you can go and debug and test it like that. So. And then a lot of the developers would use that as their life cycle, like Jenkins, and then tie it in and use the, a big pool, like 10 or 20 devices, test it, get a report back and say, all right, we're good on these devices, and then send the report back to everyone and then we can release in the App Store. So that's pretty much it. So AWS, as we know, has everything you need to get started, but then at the mobile side, we try to take everything and narrow it down even more, and then we're gonna categorize each of those services into uh, feature-based. So we're talking about auth and analytics, and then we'll talk about for the next three days of enabling these features, how to get started, how to, um, how to run it, how to install, and how to just deploy these services through command line interface, and then we'll talk about um, other services as we, as we talk about tomorrow with machine learning and AI, and how to adapt some of those uh, managed services. So we take some, uh, some stuff we'll be doing in the cloud, some stuff we'll be doing on the edge, on the device, and mix it up a little bit. So that's it for the talk. Any questions about the day, tomorrow, Thursday? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, that's the next session at uh, 11. We're gonna talk about Amplify. So 
uh, have your laptops ready. We're going to install if anybody hasn't installed it already, and we'll go through and we'll configure it um, and get it ready. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he's talking about offering like SAM and other auth pieces for uh, Amplify. Yeah, we'll discuss that um, in either the next session or the one after that. Talk about the different auth providers, so the username, password, the Google, the Facebook, and then third party, other third party providers like SAML and LinkedIn and all the other services that you might want to so, uh, provide or custom. Oh, no, right, yeah. Right, and I'll talk about that because that's a, a, a important part. So he's talking about SAM, the, the deployment, like serverless uh, framework and SAM, and CloudFormation, there's the different pieces, right, to, to deploy your uh, environment. And um, Amplify uses the CloudFormation template. So behind the scenes, it'll be building templates, and then when we deploy, it deploys that CloudFormation stack to, de to uh, do your resources. It doesn't use SAM, and it doesn't use the serverless framework, right? Yeah. With the app stores? Uh, this isn't tied into the App Store, but this is lets you be successful in the App Store because it's secure and scalable by default. So the best practice is the idea is when we do the auth or we do the app sync piece, when we deploy this app, overnight it should be able to be secure and scalable and let millions of users download and, and interact with the app in the App Store right away. So really you're worried about the front end and then we'll tie in with the back end so everything just kind of is seamless. So it doesn't really, we don't really have a deploy to the App Store, at least not yet, not one of those, those features. But yeah, when you're ready for the App Store, you build a binary and then you go through the App Store process. But the idea is just like if you were to test in the test flight or test locally, everything should be ready to go and the cloud should be the least of your problems. Yeah, so he's talking about the Unity SDK. Yes, the, um, the approach to the Unity, we are, that's not the first class right now is, is our approach. We are trying to maintain it and we're, we're taking suggestions on what approach we want to do. And as we're focusing on the Amplify and the modern and the web development piece, we want to be able to talk about the Unity. So let's talk offline and then we'll see exactly um, how out to date or what features you want to enable in the Unity SDK. Yes. So the end of day tomorrow and the end of day Thursday, we'll talk about like um, all about device farm and building the automated testing. And then the, the, we're going to talk about CICD. So the whole cycle about building the app, automatically triggering your build, and then going in and, and testing on certain devices and running reports. Yeah. So Nikhil will be here. Great. Great talk. Yeah, so can we rely on Amplify? How invested are we? And yes, this is one of our approaches right now to the modern web mobile development right now. And it's also open source and community driven. If you go to the GitHub site, you'll see a lot of stars, a lot of people contributing or asking questions or providing feedback. So it's also community driven. So it's not like even if we you know, take a step back, the community is still there and they're, they're wanting this piece and they're wanting to be able to develop and, and add more features. And you should be able to add plugins as well. So we had a serverless framework plugin that we just created, uh, Adrian, my coworker did. And so other plugins we have available and other developers can contribute anything. So it's not just for specifically for AWS that started there, but other uh, developers may be able to contribute from other uh, APIs or other services. There'll be some mix between, so that tomorrow's sessions and Thursday sessions will be um, a mix of hands-on and lectures. So a lot of it will be based on, um, if you see the schedule, I think we do hands-on, like today there'll be an hour and a half hands-on, and then tomorrow I think we do hands-on, we're gonna build a, a, a speech translation app, um, hands-on, and then the rest will be just talking. So we wanna get a mix of talking about the concepts and not just talking, and then actually doing something and building it, kind of getting experience with, with the uh, Amplify CLI, the tool chain, the tools available, and then say, okay, why does this work? How does this work? And then just kind of discuss things of, as we go. So it's always nice to like, just get our hands dirty and just play with stuff. 
and then as we go, we'll see how it works. So, okay, thanks everyone. We'll uh, take a five minute break and then we'll come back and talk about Amplify, which is sort of a hands-on, but we wanna make sure everybody can configure and install it before we get started. Thanks. <laughs>